Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this candidate forum tonight. My name is Amanda Richer. My pronouns are she and hers. I'm with the Seattle Human Rights Commission. My image description is a white woman with red hair and a brown sweater. I am placed in front of a picture of the Seattle skyline. If you are just joining us, welcome. Here are some tips on accessibility features. To access closed captioning, visit the multimedia viewer in the bottom right. Go to the bottom and click continue. A white box with a section called stream box and chat should open. Click on that icon that looks like two arrows facing away from each other or full screen option. That makes the cart full screen in the multimedia viewer. To change the size of the ASL interpreters, Click and hold on the black bar in the middle of your screen and drag it right or left. Candidates and moderators will speak at a relaxed pace for interpretation and part. Chat messages will only go to the host. Please only use this feature if you are having trouble with technology. Questions will be put into the chat once they are read by the moderators. As we begin our gathering, we respectfully acknowledge that our event today is taking place on occupied Coast Salish land and on the homelands of the Duwamish people. We pay respect to Coast Salish elders past and present and extend that respect to their descendants and to all indigenous people, their language, their culture, their struggles. To acknowledge this land is to recognize its longer history and our brief place in that history either as a first generation or 10th generation immigrant. It is to recognize these lands and waters and their significance for the peoples who lived and continue to live in this region, whose practices and spirituality were and are tied to the land and the water. I will now invite our moderator to introduce themselves and give a brief image description. Erica. Thank you, Amanda. Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Erica Chen. I use she and they pronouns. I'm the appeals chair of the Human Rights Commission. Uh, my image description, I'm a multiracial woman with light brown skin. I'm wearing pink glasses. Uh, my hair is brown and pink. I'm wearing a black top and I'm in front of a virtual background of the Seattle skyline. I'm going to describe the format of our event tonight now. We will begin with opening statements from each of the candidates, which will be one and a half minutes each. Then we will go into a longer form question section where the questions are coming from the five commissions and from the community. Those question, those answers will be limited to one minute and 15 seconds each. Um, those questions will also be put into the chat box as we ask them. You can access the chat box by clicking on the chat button on the bottom right corner of your WebEx window. Candidates, since we have such limited time together and there are many of you here, thank you. Please try your best to answer the exact question that is asked. The next section will be a quick yes or no um, question section. We'll ask the candidates a yes or no question and they will come onto their camera give a thumbs up or thumbs down, uh, and I will read out the answers. Then we will close with closing statements also at one and a half minutes each. Our timekeeping tonight, Amanda is going to be doing our timekeeping. She will give a verbal 15 second warning um, when you have 15 seconds left. Then Amanda will also come on and verbally say when your time is up. If you continue speaking and go over your time, you will be muted um, by our moderators after you go five seconds over so that we can keep this going and everybody has time. Um, so now we will start with the opening statements. For the opening statements, I will refer to candidates, to all the candidates by their full names. Um, but then going forward, I will refer to candidates by their first names. So starting now, candidates uh, will do the opening statements and could each of you also at the beginning of your opening statement, please provide your pronouns and a one time image description. We're going to go in alphabetical order by last name to start and then we'll rotate through for each of the questions. Uh, I will invite Dr. Clinton Bliss to start your opening statement. 
Hello, yes, my name is Clinton Bliss. Uh, I'm a medical doctor. I am a, a bald and I have a handlebar mustache. Um, I'm sitting in my office. Uh, I've spent my career as a medical leader developing sustainable systems that provide compassionate care for all. I've lived in Seattle for the last 30 years. In the last 10 years, we have experienced an epidemic of addicted persons moving to our city to live in a tent and use theft to support their habit and basic needs. This epidemic continues to grow unchecked and is now making our city unlivable. No amount of affordable housing and shelter beds will end tent encampments and the practice of enabling addiction through theft. The medical definition of an addicted person is one who will do anything to support their addiction and will choose their addiction over their partners, their parents, their children, their job, their reputation, their body, and their housing. If given free housing, they will trade it to support their habit and move into a tent. We have created autonomous tent encampments all over the city that protect and promote this addicted way of life at the expense of the rest of our citizens. Reinforcements arrive daily. No amount of resources will solve this problem without taking decisive action. We must get all tent dwellers out of city parks and off city streets permanently, completely, and all at once. Anything less will continue to grow the problem. While we have many cha challenges in our city that require wise and decisive action, addicted tent encampments is our most dangerous and pressing. To decisively tackle this problem, we need to emergency housing and treatment in a controlled environment that does not allow for ongoing drug and alcohol use. Hospitalization is the model we use for intensive treatment programs everywhere, for eating disorders, mental health problems, and medical problems. This, more than anything else, is why I'm running for mayor. Thank you. Our next opening statement, I will invite James Donaldson. Yes, hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, James Donaldson, a uh, longtime Seattle resident, over 40 years now. I'm running for the office of mayor of Seattle because I am sick and tired of how sick and tired Seattle has become, especially over the last half dozen years or so. Uh, you know, when I moved here in 1980, Seattle was that crown jewel of the Pacific Northwest, a beautiful, wonderful city to call home. And it's been home for over 40 years for me. I was a small business owner for 30 years, uh, involved with our community for 40 years. And the lack of uh, just uh, interest and uh, transparency from our elected officials is really what gets to me. Last weekend, we had a record number of shootings and killings in Seattle. And virtually all of our elected officials were totally quiet on the subject and refused to come out and say anything or condemn anybody. Uh, they didn't even want to say that we need to add to our police force and to refund, not defund the police. I'm all about training, retraining, and continued training of our police officers, fully funding them and getting them back up to pre-pandemic pre numbers. So that's why I'm running. I'm running because I know I can make a difference. I'm not tied to any special interest groups, any big time political endorsements, any big time money. I'm a very concerned Seattle citizen who really wants to take his gloves off, get to work, working with everybody and representing 15 seconds around our city of Seattle. This is home. I want to continue it being home and I want our young generation of folks to be extremely proud of the way we've turned this corner and put Seattle back on track. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Would you also like to provide your pronouns and image description? Don't have any pronouns other than my name is James and I'm a very tall, big black man. Thank you. Uh, I will now invite Colleen Echo Hawk and remember candidates, please start with your pronouns and image description. Hello, commissioners. I'm so glad to be here. My name is Colleen Echohawk. I use she, her pronouns. My um, image description is I have uh, long black hair, brown skin, and my background is blurred out tonight. I am grateful to be with you all. I'm grateful to share a little bit of my heart and story with you. I have never run for office, but I'm stepping up to the plate because I believe that we are ready for transformational change in our city. 
I also want to thank you all for your hard work. I'm currently serving on the Community Police Commission and the American Indian Service Commission, and I'm well aware of the amount of work and dedication that you give to our city. So thank you so much. For the past seven years, I've been the executive director of the Chief Seattle Club. I am your candidate who has proven success in solving the crisis of homelessness. My campaign has a concrete 22 point plan to bring everyone who's sleeping outside inside in 14 months. I am running because I care and love about the, I care and love the homeless community. I believe it is a humanitarian crisis that has gone on for far too long for our city. And it is the number one reason I am running. I have also been um, opposed to sweeps in our homeless community, and I am not supporting the Compassion Seattle Net initiative. I will always stand with my communities who have been marginalized and pushed away from the decision making tables. I believe we must follow the leadership of the community who has been most impacted by unjust and racist systems. This is the lens I will bring as mayor. As a community police commissioner, I stood with community groups like El Central de la Raza and the ACLU to stand against the 2018 Seattle Police Officers contract. The mayor and city council voted for that contract and that contract pushed us out of compliance with the consent decree. I am running for office because I believe that our communities deserve for someone to fight for them. We should have a mayor who knows what it's like to stand for the most vulnerable people in our community. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next, I will invite candidate Jessen Farrell. Good evening. My name is Jessen Farrell. I am a candidate for mayor. I use she, her pronouns. I am a white woman with brown hair and the background is Mount Rainier and the Milky Way over Puget Sound. I am so delighted to be here and I wanted to thank everyone for their service and thank everyone for uh, spending this evening with us. Um, I am a former state representative from Northeast Seattle. I ran an organization called Transportation Choices Coalition. I'm a single mother of three children. And most recently, I was the governor's uh, uh, chair of his task force on COVID economic recovery. I have been putting in place big public policy solutions my entire career. I helped unleash $80 billion in transportation funding as an advocate and a legislator. I negotiated, I helped negotiate the paid family leave law. Before 2017, you could get fired for being pregnant in Washington state. And I helped change that with Karen Kaiser. I also uh, negotiated our distracted driving law and many other things related to transit and affordable housing and other issues that we care about. I'm running for mayor because we can do so much better. I truly believe that in our hearts, we want to be a city of justice and shared prosperity. And that this is a moment where we need a leader who is a bridge builder. It is a moment where we need to stop patting ourselves on the back for incrementalism and put in place the big public policy solutions that we know we need, whether it is on affordable housing, public safety, homelessness, gun violence, climate change. And I look forward to working with you to achieve that vision of what we can be as a city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I will invite Lorena Gonzalez. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Lorena Gonzalez, and I use she, her pronouns. My image description is that I'm a Mexican-American woman with brown skin, dark brown hair, and I'm wearing a colorfully striped shirt in front of a blurred background. Uh, many of you might know me as the current city council president. I am also, however, much more than the title. I'm a proud first generation American, a first time mom to a beautiful daughter born right here in this amazing city. And I'm a woman of color that grew up as a migrant farm worker in central Washington with my family. I fought for victims of sexual assault and police brutality and racially biased policing as a civil rights attorney for 10 years before becoming a Seattle City Council member. And in 2015, I was lucky enough to be elected as the first Latinx person ever elected citywide. Throughout my life, I have learned that the only way we can achieve our dream is to work very hard for it. And for years, I have put my skills to work to achieve justice, equity, and fairness for our community. The ongoing fight for police accountability, reform, and transformation as a lifelong civil rights attorney is one of the many reasons I am running to be your mayor. 
I'm also running for mayor because I have the experience and relationships we need to bring people together to solve for homelessness, transform our public safety model, uh, hold police accountable, and build a city of connected, livable, safe neighborhoods for everybody. I am in, committed to building a 15 minute city that is accessible to all ages and all abilities of people across the city, a city where businesses, especially our local economy businesses can grow and where all our Time. jobs pay a living wage. And I look forward to being able to answer all of your questions and to hopefully earning your vote uh, before August 3rd, which is next Tuesday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, I will invite Bruce Harrell. My name is Bruce Harrell. My image, I go by he and him. And my image description, I am um, of mixed heritage, African-American and Japanese-American. Um, I am brown skinned with black hair with a little gray that happens. And uh, my background is my home office, which was once my daughter's bedroom. Um, you know, I. I have to tell you, thank you for your service. I've relied on commissions for many of my policy advice over the years. Um, you may recall that the we are a human rights city, um, and I was the sole sponsor of the human rights uh, legislation, creating us a city under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I um, introduced for my committee Indi Indigenous Peoples Day to talk about the the new narrative on what Native Americans have suffered during the Columbus Day situation to uh, create a new narrative. Um, what I would like to do as mayor, if I'm so blessed to be mayor, introduce a few things. One will be health care for all. Um, we'll talk more about the Seattle Job Center that I'll introduce, police reform, a measurable homelessness plan. Safety is going to be critical under my gun policy platform, creating a cabinet position. I know my time is running out, so I'll end there, but I look forward to the discussion to explain better my candidacy to be the next mayor of Seattle. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, next, I'll invite Andrew Grant Houston. Hello, my name is Andrew Grant Houston. I use he, him pronouns. And to describe my image, I am dark brown, tanned by the sun. I have black hair that is curly. Um, wearing large white headphones and wearing a white shirt with uh, blue animals on it and pink hearts with a pink matching headband. I am running to be your next mayor of Seattle. I am a queer black and Latino architect. I am a housing activist and I'm also a high risk individual. That's why in March of 2020, my last contract as a small business owner fell through. I was stuck inside uh, helicopters and flashbangs made for sleepless summer nights on Capitol Hill. And in the midst of the world's wildfires the West Coast has ever seen, I watched an orange sky burn and smoke seep through the cracks of my apartment's old windows. In instances of unbreathable air and freezing temperatures, I witnessed an inadequate response to our unhoused community's need for shelter. And so let me be extremely clear as to why I am the mayor for this moment. A homelessness emergency has been declared since 2015. And since then, the unhoused population has gone up, not down. City Council passed the Green New Deal, committing the city to effectively eliminating emissions or zero emissions by 2030. And the last emissions reported showed that emissions have gone up, not down. Over half of our emissions are directly tied to passenger vehicles, meaning we must get people out of cars. And during that time, the streetcar project has been stalled, bike lanes have been eliminated, and bus funding has been cut. We are a city here in Seattle that says all the right things but does little to actually back that up. And so we are dealing with multiple crises. And I believe that as someone who is an architect and a housing organizer, that I am the best candidate for mayor. And so I look forward to this conversation and mm -hmm. continuing to prove why. Thank you. Next, I will invite Don L. Rivers. Hello, I'm Don L. Rivers, your candidate for mayor of Seattle. Um, I am, how can I say it? Well, Choctaw, Black, Moorish, and Irish. I go out by the pronoun he. My background is an office in my home. Um, and I will start with saying, other than that, that our city is in a crisis, a disastrous crisis, homelessness, housing, small business loss, 
small business with no contracts. We Oh, Don, your audio went out. Don, are you still there? Looks like your video and audio both went out. Oh, you're back. Can you see me now? Okay. Yes, right. and we can hear you if you'd like to continue. Climate change problems. I've developed a program called the three L's. My job will be to go in with staff and learn to and listen, learn, and then lead. I'll be looking really strongly to look at the things that have been accomplished by the current mayor. Uh, congratulate for her for those things and being able to be compassionate enough to allow everyone to have a voice. Uh, I definitely want to make sure that our city moves forward to be a city of destiny. And I know the commissions are departments that really give advice. And I thank you for the time. Thank you. Okay, uh, last but not least, we do have one more candidate for opening statement. Bobby Tucker, are you with us? I am with you. Can you hear me? Okay, I do think, I think we can hear you. I can't see you as of yet though. Yeah, for some reason, uh, I'm having some uh, uh, audio problem here. But you can, can you hear okay, me? Okay, well we can, Yes, we we can hear you sound a little bit far away, but I think we should be able to hear your opening statement. Yes, uh, I'm. Uh, I'll go with the mail. The uh, oh no, the mail. Okay, African American. Um, I'm the mayor because I care, and God has made us brilliant people. Uh, just like we have space stations now, and people go into space just for fun. So with the uh, 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 housing situations, if we want it to be fixed, it's, it can be fixed. All we need to do is want it to be fixed. And as mayor, I want to follow the money. Where's the money's going? Just like we just bought a building for 17.5 million dollars. You know, instead of making that a shelter, let's make that a permanent houses. I mean, they already have the bathroom, they already have the rooms and the tubs, etc. And all we need to do is put a stove in there. I was homeless myself, my daughter and I. And shelters, what do they do? They they shelter you, but then they put you back on the streets because you don't go from shelter to a home or, or apartment. You go from shelter to back on the streets. So they shelter you around. And that would be my first thing. And I think once we get the people housed, we could send in social workers so they can find out the problems, what's wrong with people. And let's put them to work, those who can work and of course, we you know there's some exceptions to it. Few. Fifteen seconds. Okay, put them to work and um, uh, build their character and confidence. And uh, last but not least, you know we shuttle people that make six figures to work. Let's shuttle uh, people who make minimum wage to work. Time. But I'm Bobby Tucker running for Seattle's mayor. Pray for me Thank and you. bless. Me. Thank you. Thank you to all the candidates for being here this evening and for everybody for joining us um, and for providing those opening statements. We will uh, go into our next section, which uh, are questions from each of the commissions and from the community. Uh, our first question is from the Seattle Human Rights Commission. Um, Seattle is a human rights city via resolution 31420 on December 14th, 2012 as uh, he reminded us, sponsored by then council member Bruce Harrell and signed by then mayor Michael McGinn. However, Seattle is in violation of almost all of the 30 articles of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. What is your plan to remedy this? And the questions as a reminder are put into the chat box if you would like to review them. Uh, for this question, we will start with James. And you have one minute and uh, 15 seconds. Okay, thank you very much. Wow, I wasn't aware that uh, Seattle was in violation of all 30. Uh, that's amazing. Well, as mayor, I definitely would make sure that uh, uh, we take a look at each and every one of those uh, issues and rectify them as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not totally familiar with all the issues and all the details of the issues. 
but I'm a quick study and I would bring in folks who are very, very competent in those areas. Uh, I believe in human rights, of course. Uh, we need to have enhanced human rights for every human being in this country and in this world. And so that's what I would do as mayor. We would really dive into it and rectify each and every one of those issues as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Next will be Colleen. Well, number one, I think um, that we truly have to understand, I, I know that I need to understand this issue more, so I'd want to work with um, the commission to make sure that I'm fully um, grasping um, what, what we can actually do. And one of the things that I have found in my leadership is that sometimes you need to identify like the top five things that can be achieved in the next year, just to get, just to get the momentum behind it and then and be helping our city understand what the possibilities are and how it can impact our communities for good. You know, I've spent on um, the past seven years of my life um, working for some of those folks who who are their human rights are often ignored. Um, I think the most important thing that I would um, bring to this issue is ensure that we find the right kind of housing, um, the right kind of emergency housing and permanent housing that supports those those community members whose human rights have been completely uh, ignored for far too long in our city. Um, I plan on being a very active listener to our commissions. I know that. Um, as a commissioner myself on um, two commissions, that even though we are appointed by elected officials, sometimes it can be really hard to actually have um, meetings with those elected officials. So I commit, I commit to um, being someone who who listens and is in active relationships um, with the commissions and with our commissioners, um, because I believe that you all should be helping to lead the policy forward and make sure that we get to these um, these important issues. So thank you so much. Thank you, Colleen. Next uh, will be Jessen. Thank you so much. Um, as a mayor, I would be dedicated to working with you to make sure that we are fully implementing the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. I would like to highlight one issue uh, that is housing, that every single person in our community deserves housing as a right, housing as a function of human dignity, and housing as a basic pillar of economic stability. And that is why I'm proposing what I call ST3 for housing, which is the idea that we need to build 70,000 units of affordable housing across the city with every single neighborhood participating. And that means the 3,500 units of permanent supportive housing that we need for people who need those wraparound services. But that means all the way up into uh, working people who are not able to afford housing. Um, so this is something that I believe that we can do within eight years in our community. And that this also has to be a mechanism for rectifying the injustice of the past. We have to be intentional about closing the black white wealth gap, which we know that housing is such a generator of that gap. And so I am looking forward to working with the Human Rights Commission and with communities across the city to make this a city where housing stability is achievable and available to every single person who lives here. 15 seconds. 15 seconds. Thank you, Justin. Uh, next, I will invite Lorena. Hello. Um, thank you so much for the question. So, um, so I, so I really appreciate the efforts um, around the resolution to remind us of um, our commitment to the Human Rights Commission. Um, you know, the reality is, however, that resolutions are non-binding, which is why we find a situation in which we continue to find ourselves out of compliance, in addition to the lack of prioritization and focus on addressing many of the articles outlined in the UN uh, preamble and in other aspects of um, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. So uh, I think it'll be important to um, to look at where we are continuing to fail. You've already indicated that those are, um, uh, we are in violation of almost all 30 articles. I'll tell you one of the ones that presents a significant concern to me is the ongoing 
shameful lack of public access to restrooms and hygiene facilities throughout the city. And that is an area that I think um, I continue to hear from many residents across the city, especially uh, those with um, the lived experience coalition addressing and advocating for issues facing our uh, houseless neighbors to really tackle the issues related to the lack of hygiene facilities and infrastructure that is publicly available to the people of this city. So I look forward to uh, working with all of you in partnership to uh, rectify uh, this issue and to um, create a clear work plan where we can really make some difference here. Thank you, Lorena. Uh, next is Bruce. Thank you very much. So it should be noted that um, when I had come up with the notion we should push Seattle to be a human rights city, uh, everyone just didn't start clapping. In fact, um, it was somewhat controversial with time looking at what we were trying to develop as a, uh, as a conceptual framework by which we would start passing laws. And so you take uh, freedom from discrimination, which became the basis for the bias-free policing law that I passed and the race and social justice initiative that I had been working on and the race and data initiative that I'll present as I'm fortunate to be mayor. You look at access to justice, where we talked about the judicial system. And again, when you look at the bias-free policing laws and who are getting stopped for quote unquote failed taillights, again, it became the theoretical foundation by which we will push laws. You look to the right to privacy, which is another right that uh, would be declared under the human rights declaration. And that is why I led the efforts for our privacy work when we use technology. So again, while the city uh, are, are not living up to the declaration, you'll see that I'm a proven track record of protecting human rights. As a council member, we can pass laws and pass budgets. As a mayor, we can really deploy, the kind, seconds. Of, deploy the kind of efforts we need to truly be a human rights city. Uh, again, this is not going to be just my work. It's going to be the commissions helping me and the communities at large. So I look forward to truly being a leader in our Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, next will be Andrew. So something I think that is important to note is the way that the United Nations works, which is every nation has to actively believe into wanting to make change and to invest time and energy into this organization. And for me, what that means is when it comes to the, our violation as a city to all of the 30 points that we must have a city and we must have residents who are actively invested in making changes. I think for a lot of the work that has to happen and uh, for the changes and things that I proposed even within my own platform that for a lot of people, it seems like great ideas, but when you really start to push in a way that makes people either uncomfortable or they believe that they actively have to change the way that they live their life, they actually don't wanna be a part of that change. And so that's, those are the tough conversations that we should actually be having now and I have been having during my campaign in terms of my focus uh, related to these articles, I would say my number one priority would be to treat humans like humans. And so to stop the sweeps, uh, it is something that only the mayor truly has purvey over. Um, council Jesus. can do a lot and can even defund the sweeps, uh, quote unquote, but we still see them happening. And as a city that has yet to provide housing for all, which we should do, and I'm focused on, we need to stop uh, the damage Fine. that we are causing to other residents. Thank you, Andrew. Next will be Don. Um, the human rights issue has been a problem in Washington state and in Seattle and the county uh, for years. I mean, even King County has a picture of Martin Luther King with painted with a, a, a white face with the image of a black man. Uh, which is a uh, subliminal type message that I dealt with for 40 years working there. Uh, we don't and we haven't taken it serious enough until it's an issue against us personally. Uh, a lot of departments of human rights have tried to cover for agencies and, 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 and businesses. Uh, I believe the commissions are very serious about what they do, but I don't think they get the proper help and support to do that. 
I have a to keep in mind the human rights of my campaign manager, Shari Summers, who is deaf in one ear. And, and I have given her all these beautiful opportunities and she's always stand up and moves forward to do the correct thing. Uh, there are other issues in the area of I will be looking for ways and systems and programs to make human rights more effective. A lot of the offices mean well, like I, I've said. At times, I feel like we seconds. forget how important it is. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Don. Next will be Bobby. Bobby, are you still with us? Okay, maybe we'll move on to Clinton. Human rights are fundamentally about fair treatment. From my view, the most important rights are the right to life and right to equal representation. All of our other rights seem to me to be dependent upon these and flow naturally from them. My personal contribution to making our city better is running a campaign of integrity that does not take any campaign donations nor seek any endorsements so that I can provide equal representation for all of our city residents. Legalized bribery of our public officials through campaign donations gives our wealthy elite a vastly disproportionate say in our government and deprives us all of equal representation. This one unjust special privilege is deeply rooted in American democracy and until we change it, we will continue to see our government siding with the strong against the weak and we will continue to have widening income and wealth gaps with our poor and minority communities hit hardest on every front. As your mayor, I will be free to represent all of our rights and I won't have to pay back campaign debts with public funds. Human rights are also about public safety. We must have police who respect and protect all of our human rights and we must remove criminals from our city streets and city parks. Hey, this is Bobby Tucker. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, Bobby. Thank you. Okay, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, I uh, thank you for the question and we all need 1 another. There are uh, things that have been in place. I don't know everything. We have a team that we can. All we have to do is implement and work together to make our city a safe place, a beautiful place and a clean and health, healthy place for the homeless uh, that are that are homeless. I was homeless myself. I said that uh, with an experience. And so I just believe that. Uh, with a team that Seattle can be uh, the beautiful place that is designed to be that it is because they're just literally across the street from uh, the courthouse to the uh, city uh, city uh, uh, city hall. Literally, that's the city hall side of the street is clean and no uh, graffiti, but 19 feet. I walked the streets and counted them literally 19 feet apart. You got the people that are homeless and and with graffiti and all. So why is literally 19 feet different from uh, across the street? So we can do this if we want to. So as your Seattle mayor, I will make sure all of Seattle is clean and all of Seattle is safe, not just across the street and where we want seconds. to be clean. Thank you, um, Bobby Tucker, for Seattle's mayor. Let us work together, all of you guys who are running for mayor with me. Thank you, Bobby, and thank you everyone for your answers to that question. Our next question comes from the Seattle LGBTQ Commission. What have you done or what will you do to address the particular housing instability issues for the LGBTQ plus community, especially homeless youth and elders without extended family? For this question, we will start with Colleen. Yeah, I mean, what an incredibly important question. This is something that has um, uh, been something that's honestly burning inside of me um, ever since I realized that 40% of our homeless youth are LGBTQ+. It's something that I have worked on throughout my career at the Chase Seattle Club and then also partnered with folks. You know, I'm very proud to have the endorsement 
of um, Jalen Scott from the Lavender Rights Project. You know, we came together um, because we were sitting at the same table around housing uh, um, our, our homeless relatives. And, and we realized that if we partnered together, then we could potentially get 10 set asides for trans youth. And so we've been working on that um, for for uh, about a year now. And, and I am so aware that if we do not have that lens, of understanding the, the the issues that our trans youth are experiencing, our LGBTQ youth that are experiencing, that they will continue to have, they will continue to suffer. I am running for mayor because I believe in that community and believe that we have to have um, the focus and the dedication directly from the mayor's office to deal um, and, and to support these um, beautiful young people. Um, this is, uh, 15 uh, seconds. This is a passion of mine. I will work um, alongside this commission and the leaders um, in the LGBTQ community um, to, to discover the right solutions for our youth. And I will not stand back and allow it to continue to happen. Right. We've known about this for many, many years now. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to discuss this very important question. Thank you, Colleen. Next will be Jessen. This is a deeply important issue. And not only do we need stable housing for every single person in our community, but we need housing that allows each person to feel loved and cherished for, for who they are. And as a legislator, I fought for housing, uh, fought for funding for Lambert House and fought for uh, uh, funding for senior housing for our LGBTQ elders. And as part of my uh, ST3 for housing plan, building 70,000 units across Seattle, uh, it calls for, uh, um, you know, housing that meets the needs of LGBTQ, both young people and elders who are wanting to age in place as, as anyone might. So, um, this is something that I have fought for as a policymaker and will continue to prioritize as a, um, as mayor. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Justin. Uh, next will be Lorena. Thank you so much. Um, we know that the housing instability issues for LGBTQ plus uh, community members is uh, is varied. There are a lot of different reasons why people enter into homelessness. And one of the things that I um, have heard specifically and directly from members of the LGBTQ plus community is uh, is the fact that they enter into homelessness oftentimes because they are rejected by um, family members. And that's part of the reason why I worked with community members in the LGBTQ plus community to pass the state's first ever ban on conversion, so-called conversion therapy uh, in the city of Seattle. I was really proud to be able to work with community members on that as sort of a, a preventative um, uh, tool. The second thing that I did is champion the first time investment in addressing youth homelessness uh, in uh, our families and education preschool and promise levy. Uh, we also through that levy funded um, health care clinics for LGBTQ uh, plus youth directly in our school systems. I also funded an evaluation of the housing needs that uh, exist for LGBTQ plus seniors uh, through our council budget. And now those dollars are manifesting as the first ever uh, housing project for seniors on Capitol Hill that uh, are LGBTQ plus. So I'm excited to continue to support those efforts as mayor to continue to be an ally to our LGBTQ plus community. Thank you. Lorena, next will be Bruce. Thank you. I, I think my esteemed colleagues have talked about the homelessness issue for the youth, but I would also add that they are subject to other disparities, such as um, in the, the bullying situation, um, in addition to family rejection, homelessness at, as we said, disproportionate um, levels. Um, suicide rates are one of the highest in this particular uh, population. And so what we would, what will we do about that? So there's a few things. Number one is, and I, and I got to share with you that, you know, growing up of mixed heritage in the central district in the sixties and seventies, I understand being excluded from groups and being bullied by others being called names. And so I'm particularly heightened or sensitive to this issue. So we're going to create a Seattle job center to tap in everyone's gifts. 
we'll look at individual case management um, such that people can get uh, the empowerment or the esteem training or whatever they need to uh, to improve their lives, to get the love that they need. Uh, we'll look at um, a sense of community uh, that is, becomes critically important when we use our recreational facilities and our parks, our ability to gather and sort of uh, evangelize a certain spirit where you feel like you belong in a community. That's going to be critically important. So, so you'll see in my empowerment and opportunity program, you'll see mentors. It's important for people who survive this and thrive to reach back to the youth. And that's what we will lead in our empowerment and opportunity program Time. for the city of Seattle. Thank you, Bruce. Mm -hmm. uh, next will be Andrew. So speaking from my personal experience as a queer person, I would say that part of the reason that I did not come out when I was in high school was the fear that I would be kicked out from my home and to become homeless. Something that definitely resonates with me and that is why I'm extremely focused on increasing the amount of funding into our equitable development initiatives. Um, for example, our Youth Achievement Center um, project, which is being proposed and constructed down in the South End, just, uh, successfully raised over $100,000. And I believe they shouldn't have to go through the process of trying to ask community for money that the city should really be able to put up and forward. And so as part of my plan, I am focused on increasing the amount of money that the Equitable Development Initiative has by $100 million. I think we also need to speed up the process of development. Um, and I say that as someone who went to a number of open houses for the new senior LGBTQ housing that will uh, be happening on Broadway and the focus and the creation of housing, especially for our most impacted communities should not take as long as it does. And lastly, I am also focused on fixing the system of our land use. As someone who lives on Capitol Hill, I have seen the gentrification and that has caused displacement of our community from this space that we were pushed into from Pioneer Square. And so I believe it's absolutely essential that we allow for more development to happen across the city so that we can reduce the pressure on our historically LGBTQ and black and brown neighborhoods. Thank you, Andrew. Next will be Don. We have all overlooked, I must remember, that funds we have overlooked this issue i have i must remember that funds have been utilized because of COVID 19 and the the area of mental health care and uh, the issues of our youth in lgbtqia is very important i've dealt with this issue several times i will be looking at a housing project and program to be completed that's what needs to happen I have worked and talked with others before in the past, Representative Frank Chop, to really put something, a type of program together to stop for, for our young people to be able to have a place that's safe for them, but also to stop the infighting in the LGBTQIA of how they don't sometimes accept one another and to keep all of them safe. Why? I promise to take to uh, work with organizations and groups that will look for ways to deliver. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Don. Uh, next will be Bobby. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, okay. <clears throat> I think that's part of the problem. Uh, we need to help everybody that's come. It's like our African American has been suffering for a long time. Uh, our forefathers, all of our forefathers have died, but especially African Americans. And uh, it's like if we was in a line at the grocery store and everybody else cut in line. So I think it's not just for the LGBT, but it's for everybody who is or struggling uh, a decent and safe place to live. So I'm for everybody. Uh, I want to be the mayor of everybody, not just for one set of people or one nationality, uh, ethnicity, but for everybody. So that would be my uh, really statement about 
uh, helping everyone, not just a certain people because they are a certain way. Because all of us need a safe place and a clean place to live and also jobs and to uh, put back in to society and build up the character and confidence that they are need and not just treat it like uh, or we're worse than animals. So we got, okay, yeah, because we got what you call doggy care, just like we got children's care. Let us help everyone. Thank you, Bobby Tucker for mayor. Thank you, Bobby. Next will be Clinton. Well, I have no personal experience in providing housing uh, other than my own uh, doing remodels. But I have observed our city leaders reacting to our problems without understanding them and then taking actions that make our problems worse rather than better. The HALA and MHA are developer-friendly ordinances that have torn down affordable housing and replaced it with million-dollar townhomes and tiny condos that cost $400,000. And the funds collected have largely been diverted to further growth in addiction-based tent encampments. The incentive zoning program reports only six buildings. We must ensure outputs are enough affordable housing to house our people who need it. We must eradicate the dysfunction and corruption of our current zoning laws. Current programs and policies result in the outcomes of green and livable, affordable housing for those who need it. Under my leadership, the City of Seattle will develop a public-private partnership similar to our public utilities that will be responsible for providing affordable housing for people who work in our city. Our city needs a public works project of affordable housing available to those who work in our city and make less than 70% of the median household income. We will build pre-designed and pre-permitted mid-rise units situated all around the city. Residents would live close to their jobs to limit traffic, travel, and our carbon footprint. These units would provide construction jobs for people who live here as well. Time. Thank you, Clinton. And now we will have James. Yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, you know, with this question, I'm reminded of our old pastors at churches congregation. I cannot love all of you equally, but I will love you adequately. Meaning that there are some folks in the congregation, some people, some groups in society that need more attention that need more love and support than others. And our LGBTQ plus community is one of the communities. Uh, I look at our Native American group of downtrodden or oppressed or held back as much as Native Americans, not even African Americans, and I'm an African American guy saying this. And so, as mayor, I would make sure I would we would know uh, throughout our city what groups need more attention, more help, more support. In this area of housing, we need more housing. Uh, I work in the area of mental health right now, and I know suicides, suicide attempts are up for our LGBTQ uh, population, especially the young ones. So we need to be able to provide. This. That's what I would provide as mayor of Seattle. Uh, making sure that we don't just go after and treat the squeaky wheel, which gets the most, most oil, but we know in two and by figures what groups around Seattle need the help, need the support on a continuous basis. We reinvent the wheel every time around. Thank you very much, James. Thank you, James, and thank you all for your answers to that question. Our next question comes from the Seattle Women's Commission. Uh, the question is, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing women in Seattle? And as mayor, how would you address this problem? Uh, our first answer will be from Jessen. Thank you so much. And um, I am actually going to have to leave in a few minutes because I have a second engagement this evening. Uh, but this is a deeply important question to me. I think one of the most important things that the city needs to continue to work on 
is women's economic stability. And I've talked about housing stability as being one pillar, but higher wages, a living wage in this very expensive city is extremely important. And access to benefits, that means paid family leave, paid sick leave, retirement, uh, and other benefits that create economic stability. As a legislator, I have fought for these things in the state. And at the city, we need to continue to push this because uh, particularly for women of color to particularly close the gap between white family wealth and white family earnings and black family earnings and black family wealth. We need to continue to push and use the city of Seattle as a laboratory uh, to push on these three pillars of economic stability because it is good for our families, it is good for our kids, and it is quite frankly good for all of us. So those are priorities that I have. I have in my platform a portable benefits pilot project for people who do not, women and other workers who do not have access to uh, benefits. I have um, other things around cutting childcare costs. I'm running on universal free birth to five childcare because we know being able to get to work is often dependent on access to affordable childcare. We should treat it the same way as we do with our public schools. We start free education at age five. But people don't start learning at age five. They start learning uh, very early. So those are some of the things that I am going to champion as mayor. And thank you so much. I look forward to working with you on this. Thank you, Justin. And thank you for being here for the time that you could be here. Um, next, I will uh, invite Lorena. Thanks so much for this um, question. I, I think that the biggest issue facing women um, in the context of um, COVID-19 and the realities of our economic uh, situation is that we are at risk of setting uh, all of our uh, the progress that we have made in the workplace for women back by many, many years. So we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has really um, dealt a very significant blow to our childcare sector. Um, many of those jobs are done by women in our city, mostly immigrant women, mostly women of color, and women as primary caretakers in our society still uh, uh, depend heavily on our on the health and well-being of our childcare sector. So we need to be serious about filling the gap of childcare and treating childcare as infrastructure in our city is how I want to approach that issue. Uh, infrastructure for childcare means also taking care of our childcare workers while also providing that need for women who are at risk of being left out of the labor force as we continue to come out of the COVID economic crisis. Now there's a recent report that talked about how nearly 10 million mothers of young children in the labor force existed in 2019. And if we do not get serious about addressing the child care needs, we will lose many of those Did women to this economic crisis and they will never come back. So I am focused squarely on um, addressing the issues related to, to working women and working moms in particular and look forward to working with you all on those efforts. Talk. Thank you, Lorena. Next is Bruce. Okay, thank you very much. So I wanna start off a little bit on the high level having um, raised a daughter after my two sons and I'll call it um, institutional practices toward gender oppression. And what do I mean by that rhetoric? What I mean that at a young age, I think girls are taught to be second class citizens in many ways. They are told they cannot do certain things and they are somewhat limited by um, what they are told. And I noticed this when my daughter chose to be athletic and she had an inclination to go into technology. So I think we have to first recognize what institutional practices are at play for young girls. And we will do that under my race and data initiative because we don't we only look at we not only look at race issues, we look at gender issues. I was one of the uh, lead lawyers in the gender one of the largest gender discrimination cases in the state's history. We'll also look at pay that we know that the study is very clear that women are underpaid systemically institutionally and we'll be very open about the data. Uh, we'll look at representation in the workplace, not just in terms of leadership positions, but on boards and in, uh, upper management because we can, because again, discrimination is real. 
Uh, my colleagues mentioned access to daycare and paid family leave. The disparities there, certainly we will address that. And of course, domestic violence are, are still at completely unacceptable uh, levels against women. So you'll see again in my leadership that we will be keenly sensitive to these issues and will lead to policy and implementation. 15 seconds. I'll just start, I'll say Bruce Harrell for mayor because I like the way that Bobby Tucker says that. So I'll end by saying Bruce Harrell for mayor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Next is Andrew. All right. So as someone who was raised by a single parent, my mother, um, what I would start with is similar to many of the other candidates and to say that for women in particular in many cities and not just Seattle, um, child care and access to affordable child care is extremely essential. I know it was one of the reasons why my mother was even able to provide for us is to, uh, myself and my siblings was to be able to put us in child care that could be affordable. And it definitely was a struggle sometimes, but um, is something that we need to put more focus on. And I know within my own policies, my focus is on expanding universal pre-K as the precursor to having universal child care when we are able to renew the uh, family education and preschool levy. Um, the other item that I will quickly touch upon with my leftover time is we also need to make it so that whether you are a woman or family identifying, uh, you actually feel safe in public space. Um, it's something where I have had too many conversations with friends about being approached by uh, men or those who are uh, cisgender appearing men um, and just being kind of talked up or felt like uh, those people had access to um, my friends and we yeah, need to do more in terms of communication as to making it clear that that's unacceptable, but also encouraging through environmental design uh, for more people to be out and about and to also understand what it is okay. important to be a um, active bystander. Thank you, Andrew. Next will be Don. Can you do me a favor and ask the question again, please? I didn't. Can Absolutely. You it's all. Yes, it's also in the chat box if you can access that uh, from the Seattle Women's Commission. What do you see as the biggest challenge facing women in Seattle? And as mayor, how would you address this problem? If I touch this phone, I'm going to lose everything. So I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm, not, okay. I'm not going to do that. I'm a manual person, but I'm trying some new things. Um, first of all, allowing women to speak on their own behalf about their health. I remember growing up when my father put me out because I made more money than he did at 14 and 16. I had a house, five bedroom house, brick house paid for that. My mother and my grandmother made me go back when he was at work so I could take care of my sisters and, you know, the east side of Detroit and get them the things that they need. I don't speak on women issues much. Uh, helping from the city, help from the city, the county, and the state for back to school children opportunities, bringing, um, being able to do something for the substitute teachers that were actually their mothers and their fathers. Uh, preschool child care, adding uh, more, lo more locations, women mental health and wellness. Uh, areas to make sure that they're dealing with these issues, this, this violent crime, human trafficking. And uh, I received a call about two hours ago now from a um, mother of nine, but seven are girls, seven are girls, teens, and she's having problems with this human trafficking thing. So this stuff is real. So we really have to get on top of it being the fact that I have a daughter that's now a police officer. So I understand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Next will be Bobby. Bobby, are you still with us? Can you come off mute? Okay, uh, we can move on maybe to Clinton. Uh, I'm here. 
Oh, Bobby, Bobby you're there? Yeah, Wait, can you hear yes, me I can he Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Phone about to go there. But, you know, I have a 12-year-old daughter myself as a single father, and uh, and it is scary, and uh, trafficking is real. And I try, even when we're driving, I try to make sure as you observe when we're walking. Don't be on the phone. Observe. Listen. You, you, you never know. Even when she with her mom, when I... And so it's very, very important that we take care of our daughters, our, our our wives, if we have one, our sisters, our female, our friends, our our neighbors. You, you know, and working together, we can do these things. And I just think we are just too divided. That's why uh, the people with uh, that have deep pockets, rich people, or these people who are trafficking, get away with what they are get away with, because sometimes we're too much busy busy looking out for just our own and not each other. And so as mayor, that would be my goal, is to make sure we all look out for one another. You know, let's be our brother's keeper. You know, the Bible talks about who might be the person to stay next door to the person the if they live, you know, uh, in the next city or the next county from you. Those who are neighbors. Are. So, hey, Bobby Tucker for mayor, let us let us do this, not me, but what we can do. Bobby Tucker for mayor. Thank you, thank you, Bobby. Next will be Clinton. So um, the 40 hour work week works against women in my opinion. And if I could redefine it to 30 hours a week, I certainly would. That's definitely a dream. And I don't know that the, the mayor of Seattle can make that happen, but I think it limits women's progress in careers, uh, makes them less competitive with men because they focus uh, on uh, childbirth and child rearing. Um, I think more practically, child care uh, is uh, incredibly important and like any other helping and nurturing professions is generally undervalued in our society. Those who work in this profession are generally women and are paid poorly. On the other hand, when we raise the wages for our child care, it becomes unaffordable and it hits hardest on those who need it the most, our poor communities. So if we want to make a difference in the lives of our parents, children, and our working poor, we cannot rely solely on market forces to provide affordable child care. As your mayor, I will take particular interest in the Department of Education and Early Learning, as it is my belief that child care also needs to be about learning and providing equal outcomes in education. Thank you, Clinton. Next will be James. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and I'll be signing off and checking out after this uh, question and answer with me. Uh, there's no doubt women make the world go round. And I think if anything, the pandemic showed us last year uh, is the fact that without these great women in our lives, uh, that we wouldn't have made it through as well as we did. Uh, keeping the children uh, under control and safe in an environment that the children really struggled with, uh, not being able to go to school, learning online. This was mainly women having to make sure that these tasks got done. Uh, I want to make sure as mayor that our women employees are paid equally and the same as men employees. That's something I think that we can do, especially where all the city employees, the mayor should be able to go through that and make sure that that's the case without a doubt. Proven and shown even at the national level, the Biden administration, a, a woman heavy dominated capitalist. They've been shown that they've been paid less than the men workers doing a similar job. So it really takes leadership and somebody who's really bound and determined to do the right thing. Believe. 15 seconds. Yeah, believe and trust it. When they say that something happened to them in the workplace or at home or in society, Believe and trust until proven otherwise, if that's the case. So. Okay, thank you, James, and thank you for being here while you could be. Uh, and we will now have Colleen. Well, thank you so much for this really, really important question. And so much um, respect to Councilmember Harris, or sorry, Councilmember Harrell. I just feel like we don't need another study or dashboard to know the truth. 
there is a massive pay gap between women and men in the city. There was a study that came out in 2020 that the Seattle Times, or sorry, Seattle PI reported that Seattle had the fifth largest gender pay gap in the entire country. This is Seattle we're talking about in, you know, a progressive city. We talk about our progressive values, yet women make 76% to their male counterparts. Native women are paid 59.7 cents for every dollar paid to white men. So this is an incredible problem. And it's not just a problem in the city, uh, in, in Seattle, it's a problem within city government. And we have known about this since 2013 when the city established the Gender Equity and Pay Task Force. I am incredibly frustrated by this, this statistic. We talk about how women are treated in the city and we talk about how we want to be a progressive city, but yet we have this incredible disparity that we have known about for so long. So I am just worried that the talk about studies and dashboards are just a way to put off what we, what we know we should be doing. And that's taking real action to end this gap once and for all. If I am elected mayor, the city of Seattle must address this issue directly from the mayor's office. We have to um, recognize that the pandemic has shifted things in a, in, a, in a pretty interesting way that we need to respond to. We need to change our HR systems drastically. That is one of the most important things that I will be doing as mayor. Um, I also just want to quickly mention maternal health is a big deal for me as well. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you everyone for your answers to that question from the Seattle Women's Commission. Our next question comes from the Seattle Immigrant and Refugee Commission. Heat waves, wildfires, once in a lifetime climate events are happening every year. What actions will you take to make Seattle resilient to climate change and support residents during these events? Oh, we will start with Lorena. Sorry about that. I was um, greeting the arrival of my little toddler. So um, thanks for your patience as I made it back to my computer. Sorry, there's a lot of noise <laughs> where I'm at right now. I apologize. Um, uh, so this is a really important question. I really appreciate it. And um, and really, uh, you know, what we have to do is make sure that we um, elect a mayor who's going to be committed to uh, reducing our reliance on our largest carbon emitter, which is single occupancy vehicles. So we have to make sure that we are investing in clean zero emission electric vehicles, that we are creating opportunities for um, for everyone in our community to um, purchase those electric vehicles, and we need to make it safe to walk, bike, and increase the reliability and usability of transit for everyone, because we know that that will reduce our congestion and in turn improve air quality and cut down on climate pollution. So we need to recommit our transit in Seattle to um, expand transit service hours and frequency. Uh, we need to make sure that those that work a uh, nine to five job uh, continue to have access to transit, but also we need to acknowledge that there are people who work other shifts, not nine to five, that don't commute to downtown. And that is the reason why we need to be serious about expanding access to our public transit, making it more affordable and helping more households make the choice of opting out of car trips, which will save our families money and also cut pollution. So you can, uh, uh, we are also talking a lot about um, ending our exclusionary zoning that makes our neighborhoods sprawl, which increases our reliance on driving and causes I increased congestion. And so increasing our mixed Five. use zoning will allow us to, again, uh, not need to rely on uh, cars for trips. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lorena. Next will be Bruce. Uh, thank you very much. So we have some exciting um, news that came out of Olympia this year that once again, our state under Governor Inslee are showing and our legislators, one of the most diverse legislature, legislative bodies we've ever had in our history, really get things done. Our cap and trade law where we will um, clearly uh, generate millions and millions of dollars reducing the carbon pollution that we're in funds. So we'll do as mayors, once again, we will competing against them here, but we will uh, make sure that we can do two things. One is lead from a policy standpoint, for example, adopting the HEAL Act and looking at the environmental justice pieces. We know that 
um, during the heat wave that our communities and communities of color were affected the most. So we'll make sure that our individual prep work as a city will be the strongest it could possibly be. But we will also make sure that the incentives, for example, the incentives for solar power, the jobs created by renewable energy industry, we will also make sure we are a leader. Um, again, when you look at what had come out of Olympia, we have a great opportunity. We've been doing a pretty darn good job in Seattle, but it, what the recent heat wave showed us that we're not doing enough planning again. And if I get dinged on planning, then I'll get dinged on planning. Seconds. Because that's what you have to do. You plan and then you implement the policies that you know are best practices. And that's what you'll see under the Herald administration. We'll hire the best climate scientists uh, that we could, 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 could get to Time. drive the policy. Time. Thank you, Bruce. Next will be Andrew. So as an architect, certified passive house designer and a board member of FutureWise Washington, um, climate is something that's very important to me to address as mayor. And it's also why I've been endorsed by organizations such as 350 Seattle Action. And that's because all of the policies that I have have climate in mind. The biggest ones are to shift us away from use of cars and for us to put buses back on the ballot in 2022 so we can restore the bus service that's been lost from uh, COVID time. Another thing that I'm focused on is a just transition tax, and that is a progressive income tax that will fund many things, including um, affordable housing, as well as a new green building public development authority. The other thing that it plans on funding is green apprenticeships, because if we are going to build the housing that we need, we need to increase the number of workers that we have in the construction trades. And these are great living wage jobs that can be given to members of our community to actually help build their own communities. And the last thing that I'll touch on is that we absolutely need to end exclusionary it's zoning right. across the entire city. That is the only way that we are going to allow for the housing that we need and ensure that people live close to everything that they could want. Thank you, Andrew. Next will be Don. Climate change. Um, to support immigrant families, <coughs> In, in dealing out in these these areas of where farms are and uh, they're picking our vegetables, making sure the immigrant families are supported in having housing to make sure that they are covered in uh, areas of not only homelessness but dire areas, making sure that they understand that we're there for them. I I want to create a citizens. Um, registration membership form so immigrants don't get uh, pushed around the city as much, uh, considering the fact that we are a state that welcomes immigrants. Uh, find ways to help reduce admission. Work with DOT and transit to find better ways to move forward. King County, again, I spoke about this early in a, in a, a Zoom meeting about allowing the sewage waste to go into Puget Sound. And I, I'll be darned if it wasn't a couple of days after it happened again. I, I believe that King County has bit off more than they can control when it comes seconds. to sewage. So uh, developing ways to reduce uh, admissions, have a, a whole month committed to it, and understand that the winds sometime move our way with pollution. So we have to be prepared for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Don. Uh, next, we have Bobby. Is Bobby still with us? I know his, I think he said his phone was dying. Okay, I'm Bobby looking left. through the part. Okay, I think Bobby left. Thank you, Don. Okay, then we will um, have Clinton next.
heat exposure is a problem for the rest of the U.S. that most of us in Western Washington have not had to deal with previously. And we now must add it to our hospital and city emergency preparedness plans. More importantly, as our climate changes, fires and heat waves are just the beginning. We need to think differently if we intend to live on this planet for more than just a couple more generations. Most of our human systems at this point are literally a dead end. We need to develop systems that allow us to rejoin our fellow inhabitants on this planet and re-enter the cycle of life. One of these dead-end systems is trash. Even when we recycle, reuse, repurpose, reduce, and refuse, these, this delays the inevitable result that most things we have end up as trash in our landfills, lakes, and oceans. The only way we can keep our oceans from overflowing with waste is to make regulations whereby any product manufactured must be endlessly recyclable and or compostable at the end of its life. We must also abandon 19th century transportation technology of cars, buses, and trains, which are all incredibly heavy and inefficient, and instead develop lightweight, safe, and convenient individual transport. As your mayor, I will champion these changes. We must give ourselves and our children this generous gift of the future. Thank you, Clinton. Uh, next, we'll have Colleen. Well, I think that the Heat Dome event should just be a huge wake-up call for our city. You know, and the city was unprepared for this. Splash parks were closed, we closed pools um, because of the heat. We didn't open up libraries as emergency cooling center. We didn't activate the emergency operations center. And let's put this in perspective. You know, every time we have a major snowstorm, we activate the EOC. So why we didn't do this time, I don't know. And there were significant casualties. 25 people died in King County. And, and so this is something I take incredibly seriously and, and, and burdened me. I, I know and love our homeless community and they were disproportionately impacted because they had nowhere to go. And um, when we think about the big picture of this, we have to solve homelessness have to bring in our, our homeless relatives from the outside and bring them into security, stability and housing. And we have to be prepared. We need to have a mayor who's a good manager, who understands how to, how to move these systems so that we are ready. Emergency preparedness, in my mind, must be equitable and citywide. And I'm thinking about earthquakes as well. You know, we are not ready. If we had an earthquake right now, if we had another huge um, uh, catastrophe around um, a heat wave, we will continue to see BIPOC communities who are disproportionately impacted by these um, weather systems that are harming our community. We've had plenty of policy in this city, but we have not had the courage to change. When I am um, elected mayor, I will bring my proven, um, my proven record in making change, and we will do the right thing for our community. Thank you, Colleen, and thank you everyone for your answers to that question. Our next question comes from the Seattle Disability Commission. As mayor, what would you do to promote access, inclusion, and equity for people with disabilities? And for this question, we will start with Bruce. Thank you very much. Um, inclusion is the short answer. Inclusion in not just the policy development but in the measurement in the outcomes to make sure that equity is achieved. I said on another forum, uh, an incident that happened last week that a young lady visited our office on Aurora and she was um, blind as a result of cancer. And she took four buses to get to our headquarters. I would have no, I had no realization that she would have to take four buses there. But she had a bad scar under her eye because she had bumped into something at a construction site. Uh, we walked her back to the bus stop and talked to her about um, her journey. And so I have so much to learn from a person because I have sight. So at the end of the day, uh, we will rely on the Disability Commission. I had many discussions with that commission during our minimum wage discussion because I want to make sure we had come out on the, as one of the lead uh, negotiators of our minimum wage law. So at the end of the day, it will be inclusion that not in a condescending way, but in an incredibly respectful way, because we can learn from their experiences. When we look at, again, I use the expression of the description. 15 of, seconds. 
bicycles and um, skateboards, you know, on the sidewalk. Well, we have to be do better than that, and we will. So at the end of the day, inclusion. Thank you, Bruce. Next will be Andrew. So inclusion is the start, and justice is the goal. Um, what I will say is that for me, justice for those who uh, need accessibility started with my campaign. So that is something where in everything that we have posted online, there is alt text uh, and even our um, website is available in 18 different languages. And that extends to a policy that I want to see enacted, which includes changing our Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs to the Office of Non-English Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, because one of the things that we have not done in Seattle is to actually uh, move forward our language plan, which is something that does exist uh, in order to provide resources for those who do not speak English and really ensure that no matter what someone's first language is, they are able to access resources at the city. The other thing that's really important for me, especially as an architect who works with the ADA every single day, it is uh, essentially critical. It is essential for me that we invest more money into infrastructure, um, that being sidewalks and other ways that people can <laughs> and bike and roll across our cities. And that includes um, making sure that we're not just providing more transit service, but we're actually fixing that first and last mile so that people can actually access transit service. Thank you, Andrew. Next will be Don. As I, uh, as I spoke earlier, my campaign manager is um, a disabled person. Uh, part of her hearing is gone and uh, she works very well. I believe in disabled people and the abilities to be focused and work effectively. I will work and fund, I want you to get this, the Disability Commission, like I told the commissioner that I would. I definitely would do that. And I want to apologize to him for uh, the times that they have been overlooked and haven't received funds. There's been so much to do. I, I guarantee you that's the reason why it has happened. Um, I notice here, I find out that some candidates at times have some areas of disabilities, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but I, I do know that uh, Mr. Blitz and some of the others have, when they use uh, another candidate's ideas, they usually thank them for them. But uh, I've put a lot of stuff on the table that have made corrections for candidates to understand what they need to do. But our disability in the city of Seattle must be looked at, and we must be serious about it, not just a hit and miss. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Next will be Clinton. So while we have made significant strides through the American Disabilities Act in terms of making reasonable accommodations and work in public spaces, where we have failed is among those with mental disability who are unable to adequately care for themselves. I see addiction as, as part of this disability, very much the same as other psychiatric illnesses, traumatic brain injury, and developmental disabilities. In fact, most of our tent dwellers who receive disability payments use them to support their addiction. Our society evicted our chronically mentally ill onto the streets almost 40 years ago. People living in a tent have demonstrated that they are not able to provide for themselves and need assistance. We will never provide meaningful assistance to people living on the street or in tents in city parks. Hospitalization is the model we use for intensive treatment programs everywhere, whether for addiction, eating disorders, mental health problems, or medical problems. I simply tackle this problem we need emergency housing and treatment in a controlled environment that does not allow for ongoing drug and alcohol use. Thank you, Clinton. Next, uh, we'll have Colleen. 
Thank you so much for this really important question. And um, there are many parts of my platform that intersect with the goals of um, this commission and the goals of the, of the disabled community. Um, number one, I want to point out access. You know, mobility justice is what we have titled our platform around transportation. Right now, we know that our transportation are not, trans transportation systems are not working. We have to create more transportation systems everywhere, and we have to make sure that they are truly accessible to our community. I'm also championing broadband. I think that municipal broadband is an important part of ensuring that everyone has access to um, the technology that, that is, is necessary for our systems to work. I also have a food sovereignty program. You know, if you are um, disabled and are in a food des desert, then your health suffers. And we have to make sure that food accessibility and food sovereignty is part of our system as we move forward. You know, this morning I met with the deaf and hard of hearing community and I, I was in the meeting with them and I realized um, all of the times that I have not had interpretation at my meetings or the times when I have been at the board table and um, and have, haven't have asked where where is the deaf community in this issue? What are they thinking? Where, where, where are they? I need to do better. Our city needs to do better. I can commit to you if I am elected mayor that I will listen to this commission. I will ask you for your guidance and your leadership so that we serve our community in a way that is truly equitable. Thank you so much for this question. Thank you, Colleen. And next we will have Borrera. Thanks, Erica. Um, so I think, you know, first and foremost, we have to ensure that the city is in full compliance with um, uh, ADA requirements for all of our infrastructure. Um, that is, that's whether it's curb ramps or how we're building our, our um, other parts of our sidewalks or other parts of our city, we have to have full compliance with ADA requirements. The second is ensuring access to city services, uh, making sure that our services are accessible to those with disabilities, whether it's sight-based or hearing-based is critically important. I was really proud to vote in support of legislation that advanced uh, closed captioning at our city council meetings, for example, and, um, and also voted in support of ensuring closed uh, captioning on um, on a general viewing um, uh, of the TV throughout throughout um, the city. The third thing that I would say is economic security programs are critical to the to the resilience and the success of those in our dis disabled community, including ensuring that our Office of Labor Standards is protecting the rights of those currently employed in Seattle. And then lastly, um, I want to address discrimination, whether it's in housing or employment. Uh, we can and should be investigating those incidents of discrimination in those in those environments to ensure the fair and equitable treatment of um, of those who uh, have um, disabilities. Fifteen seconds. Thank you, Lorena. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your answer to that question. We have one more um, long form question, and it's coming actually from our audience. Um, when folks registered for um, this forum, they had the opportunity to submit a question. So this question is coming from Howard Gale. Do you believe the current police accountability system is working? If so, can you point to consequential uh, discipline, not reprimands or days off, uh, for SPD officers engaged in abuse of protesters? And if not, how do you propose to change it? For this question, we will start with Andrew. So to be clear, no. And even with the creation of the Office of the Inspector General and the Office of Police Accountability, what we have seen, especially in the past few weeks, is that there simply are not enough ways that we can truly keep police accountable and hold them responsible for their actions or transgressions either against citizens or um, for their actions of sedition. And so that is why I stand as the only candidate who is committed to defunding the police by at least 50% because we need reform of the police department, but at the same token, we also must ensure for every single individual in Seattle that we provide the same level of public safety. 
And so outside of defunding SPD, I think we also need to really work at the state level to have changes in our laws so that we can truly hold police accountable. One of the biggest ones being that we actually decertify officers when they violate laws. Something that I actually learned um, from a friend of mine just a few days ago was talking with them, or sorry, uh, a new uh, acquaintance was yesterday. And they live in Everett, and Everett actually hired two of the six officers who were let go from SPD related to the January 6th insurrection. And so that would not have been possible if we had decertification. And that is why I make it clear that it is absolutely essential <laughs> to not just reform, but also change laws to keep police accountable. Thank you, Andrew. Next will be Don. Thank you. I've worked very heavily in this area over the last 30 years. Uh, 25, we did a racial uh, profiling and uh, summit, uh, commitment summit, and that, that helped us to get a good start on what was needed. Most of the people that are involved with this broken system of policing on the criminal justice side and I would say on the social justice side, don't understand the community's needs. And the community hasn't had a clear picture of positive policing. They've had it of negative policing. And this interaction with the community that police have done inappropriately have been accepted for so long, even the infighting themselves among themselves of silence so that things are not accomplished. It needs to be totally restructured from a criminal justice side and a social justice side. It's no need to defund something that needs to be restructured because that those funds is what's going to help restructure the department. And you know what? In order to work with police, you have to know the insides and outs of the police department. I know that. And most of you don't. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Next will be Clinton. As a leader, I understand that core values like police accountability can never be safely negotiated away. The Seattle Police Department has been under a federal decree since 2012 for repeatedly violating our residents' civil rights. The judge determined these violations stem from a lack of police oversight, specifically our police union contract, which protects rogue police officers from disciplinary action and prosecution. In response, our city negotiated minor revisions to the existing police union contract in 2018. In 2019, the federal court found the city remains in violation. The city currently has no timeline for resolution. We, we cannot continue to do business like this. Uh, we have to hold our police accountable. And I would, if elected mayor, remove any portion of the police union contract that limits accountability and oversight. Our police are given a special power to take away our civil rights when necessary to protect the rights of others, but it's at high risk for abuse and we must have absolute oversight and accountability from them. Thank you, Clinton. Next will be Colleen. Yeah, uh, well, thank you for the question, Dr. Gale. I absolutely believe that our current police accountability system is not working and we have so much work to do. I agree with Dr. Bliss that yes, we have um, been under this consent decree for um, a very long time now and in 2017, uh, the community police commission and and the city council we all supported um, some wonderful um, some wonderful work landmark police accountability. And then 2018 happened and we got ourselves into a terrible contract. I just want to, uh, you know, say that I stood with the community police commission with our fellow commit my fellow commissioners and said that this is a contract that is going to harm our community. And we all saw what happened over the summer. We have police officers that were just out of control during the protest movement, um, uh, doing things that were um, violent and terrible to our community. And so um, as, as uh, when I am elected mayor of the city, I will negotiate a new contract that truly 
holds our police accountable because right now we don't have that much we can actually do to discipline an officer. The contract protects them. The contract protects them. That's why they were, they didn't, they didn't follow the chief of police direction to, to, um, to cover or to uncover their badge numbers because they seconds. knew that this contract protected them. We have to have a new contract. We have to make sure that our community members are protected, and we have to fulfill the consent decree, and then we transform Seattle Police Department. Transformation is what I'm looking for. Thank you so much for the question. Thank you, Colleen. Next will be Lorena. Thanks, Erica. Um, so I know that um, Howard has been advocating for a long time for us to abandon the 2017 police accountability structure that um, that I sponsored in the legislation. In that legislation, it created a three um, stool accountability system. It made the community police commission permanent. It created an office of inspector uh, uh, general for public safety, and it further civilianized the office of police accountability. And um, and I remain committed to that fundamental structure because I believe that those three components are important. So I think if the question is uh, positing that we should abandon the CPC, OPA, and the IG, I just cannot support that kind of a proposal. Now, do I think that the system always gets it right? Absolutely not. And in 2017, when we worked together with community to pass that ordinance, we talked very, very clearly about how it was going to be tested, how that system was going to need to be reevaluated and how we were going to continue to be committed to changing it to make sure that it is truly achieving accountability and reform within the police exactly. department. Of course, this last summer showed us that uh, even though we've been under a consent decree for 12 years, we can still see a police officer using the same tactics that they used uh, in cases where people died and were killed. So we have a lot of work. I have a civil rights experience and I'm committed to um, getting this over the finish line. Thanks, Lorena. Next will be Bruce. Thank you very much. So is the system working? Um, I, I would agree that it's not working as effectively as it could. We can do better. That's my short answer. And I guess it's, you know, out here in the campaign trail, there's a reason why the leaders of the NWCP support my candidacy. It's the reason, reason why Reverend Walden, the accountability advocate, supports my candidacy. Lem Howell, one of the original civil rights lawyer, and I use terms like names like Erdman Bascom and Larry Ward, because some of us have been doing this work for decades. And so what we will do is we will negotiate a, a relaxation from that 180 day rule investigation, because I think we, we conceded that, and I think we'll be in a position to expand that. We will increase subpoena power. We will, um, advocate for more civilian investigations. And I will tell you what was done in Olympia was some great work by advocates who are supporting me um, in terms of police accountability. So we will do a full court press. We will make amendments to the structure if needed, but know that in my candidacy, you've had a person that's been fighting for what we used to call police brutality for decades. And I think you're gonna need that kind of passion and commitment to really change the culture in the Seattle Police Department. And that's why I talk about the culture so much. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you everyone for your answers to that question. We're going to move on to our yes, no section, um, and then we'll have closing statements. We are running maybe just about five minutes over time. Hope that's okay. Um, I would ask that all uh, six candidates, please turn your videos on. I will ask a yes or no question and then give a three second countdown and all candidates, please either give a thumbs up to indicate yes or a thumbs down to indicate no. I will then read off your name and your answer and then we'll move on to the next question. There are four yes or no questions. Let's start with a practice. Does everyone understand the instructions? We got Thumbs up, maybe not from Lorena, and no answer from Don. <laughs> Thumbs up, great. 
Okay, so it'll be, I'll ask the question. I'll go three, two, one, and then give your thumbs up or thumbs down. I hope that clarified. Okay, so our first yes or no question is, do you support the Black Lives Matter movement? Yes or no? In three, two, one. Bruce is a yes. Lorena is a yes. Colleen is a yes. Clinton is a yes. John is a yes. And Andrew a yes. Yes is across the board. Thank you. Next question. Are you a renter? Yes or no? Three, two, one. No from Bruce. No from Colleen. Yes from Lorena. No from Clinton. Yes from Andrew. And yes from Don. Thank you. Next question. If elected, will you consistently abide by the resolutions and budget recommendations from the city council? Yes or no in three, two, one. Yes, double yes from Lorena, medium from Colleen, no from Clinton, medium from Don, yes from Andrew, another medium from Bruce. Y'all, that was not part of the instructions. This is a yes or no question. We don't have time. Moving on. Last yes or no question. If elected, do you promise to connect with the commissions when an issue you are addressing directly impacts their population? Yes or no in three, two, one. Yes from Bruce, yes from Lorena. Yes, Colleen, uh, medium, maybe from Clinton. Yes, from Don. Yes, from Andrew. Okay, thank you all for participating in our yes or no <laughs> section. We will now have our closing statements and we're actually back to being on time. That went quickly, thank you. So our closing statements are going to be a minute and a half each and uh, I will invite Don to start. I told a former mayor this years ago when I was 24 years old, the last shall be first. And he used the statement in his candidacy. So I'm gonna say this to you with all importance in my heart. You can't keep bringing a broken horse back to the barn and expecting somebody to ride it the next morning. Seattle has done that for years. We can't keep using recycled politicians. Seattle's have done that for years. If it's true change from what Andrew Taylor has done and all the other advocacy groups, the change must happen from the top down. And we must understand that this is not an old Seattle any longer. It's a new Seattle, a city of destiny. And we must be all involved all included, no one's excluded, but I expect some to exclude themselves. So I'm running for Mayor of Seattle, Don Rivers, www.donnellrivers.com. Please join me. It's not a fair system. It hasn't been fair from the TV all the way through, but I'm still in it to win it. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Next, I will invite Clinton. In my campaign, I am not accepting any contributions nor seeking endorsements, and as your mayor, I won't have to pay back campaign debts and endorsements with public funds and contract favors. Our city cannot afford to continue to make reactive and biased decisions that waste our precious resources. We need real value from our tax dollars if we are to solve our problems. That is why I am running for mayor. As a fellow human being, I understand that we all want more for ourselves and our children than a box to stand on while we look over the fence and act real quality needs outcomes in our schools, our courts, our hospitals, and our government. I intend to invest in equal outcomes for all, to grow the long legs of true equality, giving each person the power to stand tall in their own authority, running freely on their own two legs and going toe to toe with their peers. Real equality creates a level playing field that lasts a lifetime. If elected, I would immediately nullify any section of the police union contract that limits accountability and oversight, create a robust and rapidly responsive police force that provides constitutional community policing 
provide basic emergency food, shelter, security, and treatment to our residents who have no other options, and permanently remove addicted tent encampments from public spaces and city parks. If you want more of what you've been getting, vote for our city leaders who brought it to you. If you want a leader with integrity who will act decisively to bring lasting solutions to our pressing problems of addiction, homelessness, and police brutality, vote Dr. Bliss for mayor. Thank you. Next will be Colleen. Hi, well, thank you so much everyone for um, being here tonight. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but I, um, I can't tell you how much, I, I know how much work you all do. Having been a commissioner, I'm in two, on two commissions right now. And the amount of work and volunteerism and dedication and, and true public servant hearts is, is what you all do. So thank you so much. And I can tell you that as a commissioner, I have often felt unheard. You know, many of our commis commissioners are appointed by elected officials, but sometimes it can be really hard to get a meeting with, with the person that actually um, appointed you. I commit to monthly town halls with our commissioners, 90 minutes to talk over issues and discuss solutions. I also commit to remembering the expertise of the commissions to help lead and guide policy that truly represents our communities. I am incredibly grateful for you all and the work that you have brought to City Hall. And I will take that same uh, appreciation with me to the mayor's office. Um, you know, those of us who, who serve our communities, we know um, we do it because we love and care about our communities. When I was thinking about running for office, I, I talked to several elders. One of them was my uncle, Fred John. And I said, I'm thinking about running for office. He said, yes, you're doing it. And he also said, Colleen, remember that in our language, the Athabascan language, that there's no word for leader. The word for leader translates to servant. If you were to run for office, you were to be a servant to the city of Seattle. And that is the lens that I will bring to the city. I want to be a true public servant. I invite you to check out all my platforms. Um, you'll find um, a, a, a lot of diversity there. I am honored to get to have spent some time with you all today. So thank you so much. Check out our website at echohawkforseattle.com. Thank you, Colleen. Next is Lorena. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for uh, hosting this really important forum and um, asking really important questions. Uh, once again, I'm Lorena Gonzalez. I have had the honor of being a public servant in this city for six years, and I am asking for your support and your vote to be Seattle's next mayor. I am really humbled and honored to be endorsed by so many progressives across the city uh, including Congresswoman Pramila Diopal and many unions who represent thousands of workers across the city. I'm proud to be running in this campaign as a candidate who is strongly supported by working families, working families that I have fought to support and to lift up, uh, not just during COVID, but before, long before COVID. And I uh, am honored to uh, have an opportunity to build on my progressive record of fighting for better labor standards, of fighting for paid family leave, of uh, fighting for more police reform and accountability, both at the city level, but also at the state level this last legislative session. And uh, I look forward to putting my uh, 10 plus years experience as a civil rights attorney and advocate in this community and as an advocate for immigrant and refugee communities to work as the next mayor of this city. As a city council member, I um, have been limited in my role to being able to look at budgets and fund my priorities and lead with my values there. Uh, but as mayor, I will have an opportunity to work together with the city council to build a shared vision to hold our wealthy and most profitable large corporations accountable to pay their fair share and to once and for all solve the crisis around homelessness by bringing us together around that common vision by again making sure that we are not biting around the edges, but that we are adequately funding the housing and the services needed to really once and for all end this crisis in our city. And I look forward to working together with all of you and others in our community to tackle the realities of climate justice. We have 10 years to make a real difference here. And I am motivated to do that by the fact that I am now a mother 
And I want to be able to leave a planet and an earth behind for my daughter where she can breathe the air and drink the water and continue to enjoy this beautiful city that I continue to love and would be honored and humbled to lead as your host there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to Lee Bruce. Thank you very much. And thank you commissioners for um, sticking around and hearing our stories. Uh, they are indeed impressive by many of my colleagues. Um, what you will get in my candidacy, quite frankly, is just someone that just doesn't make excuses. The big issues, they will rest on our shoulders, my shoulders as the mayor, whether it's homelessness or small business revitalization, protection of human rights, the protection of people who are less able. I make no excuses. And I explained to my three kids that uh, I could have let many of the impediments in my personal life get the best of me. And there are many excuses I could have made, but I hope to leave with the <coughs> mayor. We will introduce health care for all, making sure everyone in this city has health care. It's unprecedented. We will create a Seattle job center such that everyone can tap into their gifts and nurture those gifts. And in addition to that, they will find routes where they can get training and services and grants to pursue those gifts. A race and data initiative, I think people are misunderstanding that they are critical because not only do we look at the results of, for example, why women are underpaid, but why? We have to know the why in order to fix the problem, not just the results that many studies do. It's much deeper than that. Uh, the homelessness plan will be measurable for you to see that we will lead with compassion. We will make sure that our human rights legislation governs our policies. And on police reform and gun safety, you will see that the dramatic change, a sea shift in what we do if I'm elected mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, dog barking. <laughs> Last but not least, for our closing statement, Andrew. So thank you to the commissions for creating this space today and for allowing us to continue this conversation, which I find very important. That being said, part of the reason why I'm running is that we have a lot of great Seattle process. We have a lot of listening to community without actually acting upon the suggestions that are made by a community and by the 70 commissions that we have at the city of Seattle. I believe it is time to finally end the Seattle process and to embrace the change that is necessary in order to not just reform our system, but to build new systems that lift all of us up, starting with those with the least first. And I know that it is absolutely essential and why I'm running in this moment is because we are dealing with a multitude of crises, affordability crisis, a homelessness crisis, an economic crisis, and most critically, the climate crisis. And as someone who is an architect, who is a project manager, who focuses on managing multi-million dollar projects, I know that in this decade of the Green New Deal, and with the support of my endorsements of 350 Seattle Action, uh, Sunrise Movement, High School Hubs, as well as the Transit Writers Union, that I have the coalition, I have the movement, as well as the knowledge and know-how to get things done. And after four years of inaction with a career politician mayor who has said all the right things, but not actually done them, I believe it is time for a different kind of seconds. leader and a mayor who will act. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the candidates. Thank you for being here spending your evening with us. I just want to close out and say uh, that we hope everyone has registered to vote in the August primary on election night, August 3rd. Make sure your ballot is submitted to a ballot box before 8 p.m. Uh, to find one near you, or we'll put a link in the chat box. Um, and I just want to thank everyone from the five commissions who helped put this event together, our interpreters, you've been amazing, and our uh, cart captioning person. Thank you to Marta Itoru and the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, thank you to all the candidates and your staff for um, coordinating with us. And with that, I will um, say goodnight to everyone. Candidates, please stay on for just a moment. <laughs>